When I was younger, I loved milk. Milk was like my favorite drink ever. The only thing better than regular milk was chocolate milk. Chocolate milk was like milk, but better. It's like the Tom Brady of milk. Preach. Nothing gets better <laughs> than chocolate milk. And my brother, he loved chocolate milk too. And he didn't want to share his chocolate milk when my parents bought it. So he came up to me one day and he says, hey, Jason, I want to tell you a secret. And I went, I want to hear a secret. I want to know all the secrets. Tell me. And he goes, you know chocolate milk? I'm like, yeah, I know chocolate milk. I love chocolate milk. He goes, you know how it's brown? I'm like, yeah, of course it's brown. It's chocolate milk. He goes, you know why it's brown? Like, no. And so he looks at me and he goes, it's brown because they put poop in it. And I'm like, no, no, I've been drinking this for years, no. And I legitimately did not drink chocolate milk for two whole years. And when I finally found out that he had lied to me, I was so upset with him. Because I love chocolate milk. It was delicious. It's something that I craved. And since he kept me from having it, I wasn't very happy about it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter's going to talk a little bit about craving a different kind of milk, about wanting to have it and being, being a little upset when we're separated from it. Starting off in verse 1, he says, So, really, therefore, put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. So this first word, so in the ESV, but therefore in the NIV, what we have to do is we have to say, What's that? Therefore, therefore. You guys have heard that a hundred times, right? So we go back to chapter one. In chapter one, when he's ending this chapter, he says, he's, he's talking about this brotherhood, this brotherly love between Christians. He talks about the word of God. He talks about how thankful he is that God gave this salvation. But he ends the chapter talking about brotherly love. So we know something about, about brotherly love, about Christian love that's going on. Therefore, we should put away or rid ourselves of these sins. We know there's a connection going on there. And this word, rid yourself, really what it should be translated is after ridding yourself. He's saying, this is step one. If you don't do this first, don't pass go, don't collect $200. Do this first, and then you can move on to verses two and three. So first we have to rid ourselves. And this verb rid, this verb rid ourselves, really, it, it's like you're wearing a dirty jacket. And you realize how filthy it is, and you're like, man, this is disgusting. I don't want this on me. And so you take that jacket off and you throw it into the laundry pile. That's what this verb means. We're supposed to take this jacket of sins that we've been wearing, we're supposed to take it off and cast it into the laundry pile. And then he lists five specific sins. And the first one is malice. And malice is kind of a weird word that we don't use a ton. But what it is, is this anger, this hatred that makes you want to hurt someone. It's that feeling you get when your brother breaks into your room when you're not home and steals a bunch of your video games. And then when you go in front of him about it, he's like, oh, no, I don't have them. And you just want to like, punch him in the nose and make him give them back. That's malice. Or when your sister ran up to your parents when you were little and goes, he called me ugly, even though you didn't. I mean, she is ugly and you were thinking it, but you didn't say it, so you shouldn't get in trouble for it. And your parents yell at you anyway, so you just walk up and be like, woman, why did you do that? That, that feeling is malice. And all other four sins listed here are related. First of all, we have deceit. Lying. Because you don't have a problem lying with someone, or lying to someone that you don't like anyways, right? And we have hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is saying one thing and doing another because you don't have a problem being fake with someone that you don't like anyways. Then we have envy. And envy is kind of the root sin here a lot of the time. If you're jealous of someone that can grow into anger, that can grow into malice, and desire to kind of cut them back down to sobs. And lastly, we have slander. Let's be honest, it happens on a Bible college campus all the time. If you don't like someone, you just talk crap behind their back. And these are the sins that Peter says to avoid. And he says to avoid them because these are sins that build a wall between you or your, and your brother and sister in Christ. If you are committing these sins, if you are being a hypocrite, if you're being slanderous, if you're hating them and wanting to hurt them, there's a wall there. And we shouldn't allow that to occur. And then all of a sudden, he, he launches into this, this other discussion, almost, about, about babies 
and milk. But first of all, I think, I think we need to get a little bit of more of a grasp on what these sins look like before we can really appreciate the next two verses. So I want to tell you about, about a Bible college student named Mary. Mary has about a year left in Bible college. And she's going to go into youth ministry full time, and she's so excited. And things are going pretty well for her. I mean, she's making good grades. She's involved in ministry. She has a lot of friends. And her parents didn't want her to be at Bible college at first, but they've come around, and they're happy she's here now. Mary's living a pretty good life. She has a friend named Tina. And Tina, I can't describe any other way than, like, a female Jason Merriman. Like, she does everything. And she's good at everything. I mean, she's athletic. She skateboards. She plays, like, 25 instruments. She can sing. She can preach. She can teach a youth group. She does everything, and she does it well. And to boot, she has so many friends. Everyone likes her. I, I don't think people can even be angry at this girl. That's what Tina's like. And Mary, well, she starts to get a little bit jealous. She thinks, man, I wish I could talk to people like Tina can. Man, I wish that I could speak in front of crowds like Tina can. I wish that I could lead a youth group like her or even play one instrument. This girl, she plays guitar, she plays bass, she plays drums, she plays bassoon. I, Mary doesn't even know what a bassoon is, but she knows that Tina plays it. <laughs> and she's getting a little bit jealous. And then jealousy grows into what Peter would call envy. And then that, that envy, it grows to the point where Mary is angry whenever she's around Tina, and that is malice. And she decides she needs to cut her back down to size. And so when Mary asks about that, that boy that she likes named Drew, well, even though, or when Tina, sorry, asked about that boy she likes named Drew, then even though Mary knows, yeah, he has a thing for her, and she goes, oh, no, you don't have a chance. You should just give up. And that's deceit, lying, trying to hurt someone. And then she goes behind Tina's back and walks up to Drew and says, you don't want a girl like that anyway. She's, she's depressed. She's anxious. There's so many things wrong with her. Don't even mess with her. That is slander. And then just, just to boot everything else, Mary starts taking on some extra ministry positions. So it's not because she loves God. It's not because she wants to serve people. It's just because she wants to look better. She wants people to look at her the way that they look at Tina. And doing those ministries with an impure heart, that is hypocrisy. And so Mary finds herself in all of these sins. And finds a wall being built between her and Tina. And if these sins ever come to light, it's going to blow a hole in that relationship so large that I don't think anything can ever fix it. And that's what Peter's talking about here. And then he goes into verses 2 and 3. He starts talking about babies. He says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. I promise these two things relate, but we have to understand these verses to understand how they relate first. He says, like newborn babies. And a lot of people think that he's talking about, like, baby Christians. He's not. He's just using it as an example to explain this word, crave. Has anyone in this room ever worked with a baby before, even as a relative? What does a baby do when they're hungry? Cry. They cry. But cry isn't even the right word, right? Because they cry and snot flies out of their mouth and they turn bright red, turn this like molten ball of lava with limbs. And they kick and they scream and they don't stop until they get their food. That's what he's talking about with craving here. He's saying being insatiable, refusing to stop until you get what you want. And Christians should crave this pure spiritual milk like that. So now we have to understand what pure spiritual milk is. The first word we need to understand is pure. And we're going to have to go into the Greek for a second, but I promise I'll keep it quick. Pure, the word for that is adolos. Literally, a, just like in English, means not or without. Dolos means deceit. Without deceit. This is milk that doesn't lie. Milk that is exactly what it says it is. It's no more or less than what it says. It doesn't have any antibacterial stuff in there. It doesn't have any hormones or additives or preservatives. It's just milk. This is 100% USDA certified organic spiritual milk. The next word is spiritual. And spiritual, it does kind of mean metaphorical, which I'm happy about, because I really didn't want to like milk Casper the friendly ghost to get this stuff. He's talking about metaphorical milk, so we don't have to worry about that. But the word used here is logicon. And logicon kind of means like divinely reasonable, which is weird. It means divine, it's from God. And reasonable or rational, it makes sense. It's something uh, academic, something in your brain almost. 
And he gives us one more hint. He says, so you may grow up in your salvation. Now this term, I think, is Peter's way of saying what Paul would say as becoming the mature man, or growing into the head that is Christ, which are phrases we've heard before, right? It just means to grow up, become a better Christian, to get closer to God. So this milk, it's pure. It doesn't lie about what it is. There's no additives in it. We also know that it's from God, that it works with our brains a little bit, and that it grows us as a Christian. Hebrews 6.1 says something about growing in maturity and learning about Christ going side by side. Right? As you grow in maturity, you learn about Christ. As you learn about Christ, you grow in maturity. So presumably, this milk teaches us about Christ, about God. And what this sounds like to me is that Peter's talking about Scripture, the Word of God. And that makes a lot of sense because the word logikon comes from the same Greek root as logos, which is a word that Peter uses in the first chapter to talk about Scripture, to talk about the Word of God. He's making a pun. So if you guys like puns, they're in the Bible. He's reaching back to chapter 1 and saying, remember when I talked about the logos, the Word of God? Yeah, well, that's what I'm talking about here. Christians should crave Scripture the same way that molten, angry ball of baby craves milk. That's what he's saying here. And he even gives us a reason why. He says, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. And that word good really means delicious or tasty or appealing. Now that you've tasted that the Lord is tasty, that the Lord is delicious, that you want more of that, that word from God in your stomach. That's, that's the picture he's painting. So we have that the, the word of God, that God, it's, it's delicious, that it's good for you, that it's something that you should crave. We also know that there are these sins that we need to avoid because it builds a wall between you and your brother, but how on earth do those two things relate? Well, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks a little bit about how if you're giving a gift to the altar and you realize your brother has something against you, you should stand up, go be reconciled, come back, and then alter, offer the gift to the altar. And the reason why he says that is it seems to me that both Jesus and Peter are saying the same thing. If there's a wall between you and your brother, then there's a wall between you and God. You can't hate your brother and love God at the same time. That's not like something that John says, right? You can't hate your brother and crave the word at the same time is what Peter's saying here. So what does this look like for Mary? Well, Mary has, has given herself over into these sins. She, she's hurting her friend Tina out of jealousy, out of malice. And then she realizes that her devotional life is slipping. That when she's digging into the Word, it just doesn't feel like God is there anymore. And it hurts. And a verse pops up in the back of her head, and she realizes, man, I really need to be reconciled. And so she goes to Tina, she admits everything that she's done, and she says, I'm so sorry, I don't know if you can ever forgive me. And maybe Tina forgives her, and maybe it doesn't. Or maybe she doesn't, but what matters is she attempts. She, she goes to be reconciled. She puts her sins out in the open. She decides, I'm not doing this anymore. She takes off that jacket of sin and casts it into the laundry pile. And then when she goes back to the Word, she opens up her Bible, starts studying again. Suddenly, God is there again, and it feels good to have him back. This is what he was talking about. Leave these sins behind. Rid yourself of these sins. Fix the feuds that you have with your other Christians, with your Christian brothers and sisters. And then read the word. And you will crave it like no other. Mary tastes of the, the word that the Lord is good. And then she craves it like she never has before. The same thing happened for us. Feuds with our Christian brothers and sisters, issues with our family, whatever's going on, it can't get between us and the Word. Because if Peter's trying to communicate anything to us in this passage, it's two things. The babies want milk, and we want the Word. Thank you.